our next presenter, Professor Jean Seaton from the University of Westminster in London, is also the official historian to the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC. And she is very sad, I know, that she can't be with us here. Uh, she had foot surgery a couple of weeks ago and still can't travel. But as sad as she is that she can't be with us, we're very happy that we still can enjoy her presentation uh, thanks, thanks to uh, some IT solutions. Uh, once upon a time developed here in Sweden. <laughs> Skype video. Uh, and if we're lucky, we might get one of those BBC moments where there's a grandchild running in or something happening outside of frame. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jean Seaton. I'm very, very sorry not to be there. Um, my my uh, is a real nuisance. I want to take you back to uh, me in about 2008. I am sitting in uh, a UK government office called the Cabinet Office which is a very sort of central part of government. And as the official historian of the BBC, after various meetings and discussions and wheedling and no doubt, absolutely undoubtedly, decisions, I have been given access uh, out of uh, the historian, the usual historical access to papers. So I've been given privileged access Papers have been declassified for me to see about uh, the conflict uh, in Northern Ireland during the 1970s and 80s, which the BBC played a key role in. So I'm sitting on a, on a day like this, a rather warm sort of afternoon in the spring, as us historians do, with a great pile of files in front of me. And of course, I understand that the Cabinet Office, over such a delicate issue as Northern Ireland, where there are lives, you know, there are still people around in, 2000, in 2007 and eight, like Martin McGuinness, who played a live part, where the issue of terrorism and threats to Britain and threats to Ireland was still very sensitive. So I completely understand that material, lots of material will have been redacted, that's fine. But I had asked, because I'm a cunning historian, um, for, to be able to see papers, particularly on a peculiar episode when the BBC and all broadcasters in 1987 were banned. It's called the Broadcasting Ban. They were banned from broadcasting the voices of IRA and Protestant terrorist organisations and, and indeed Sinn Féin as well. So they were, why did the government decide suddenly in 1987 to ban the BBC and other broadcasters from broadcasting the voices, just the voices of um, these men who'd been, and women who'd been part of terrorism. Um, because things were getting a little bit, bit better and it did immense damage to the BBC all over the world. Suddenly the BBC looks fit as being censored. So the World Service, a great the Cold War has not finished in 87. So the, the, the BBC World Service, hugely influential uh, broadcaster all over the world, is damaged by this sense, huge sense that even during the Second World War, um, there had never been that kind of censorship on the BBC. So why did the government do it? And I am sitting in front of a great pile of papers, like you do, and it's a hot afternoon, and I'm a, bit, I'm a bit bored, and I wouldn't mind a cup of tea, and it's been going on for a very long time. And what you get in 1987 is a set of papers. So in 1987, there's one coded fact, which is that um, just earlier, uh, Lord Mountbatten had been murdered by the IRA and 19 soldiers uh, blown up. So this was one thing. And then three soldiers were killed just, just before the broadcasting ban. And I knew from interviews and other uh, government papers that Mrs. Thatcher, who was the prime minister, had gone fissile. 
over it and said, you know, we really must do something about the IRA. So was that the reason? So I'm trundling through the papers. So you collect the papers, but people like me, very slowly, sadly, that's where we spend our lives, going to the papers. And what I encounter is the fifth iteration <laughs> of a set of Home Office and Northern Ireland Office considerations about the legal propriety and the pros and cons, the, the advantages and disadvantages of introducing such a broadcasting ban. And it had first been discussed in 1978. So here are these poor people, poor civil servants in 1987 going through. And this particular paper, which looked identical and had many of the same arguments, has 60 pages, so it's long. And um, trundle, trundle, yawn, yawn. And the, the, right at the beginning of the paper, it says, we are going to consider, consider the 18 additional arguments against introducing uh, a broadcasting ban and the 21 legal issues we've considered and the 17 positive, pos possible advantages. And this paper reads identically to several other papers I've already read. And, and perhaps, you know, these things are entirely accidental. So I trundle on reading through these arguments about legal whatevers and advantages and disadvantages, this very stupid action. And then, and then, in pen, written with an old-fashioned pen on the manuscript of this paper, on the penultimate page, the page before the last page, uh, and the paper as a whole had arriven, arrived at a decision which was on balance. It was stupid to introduce the broadcasting ban, but there might be some advantages. So classic piece of uh, administration, balanced, you ask me to look at it again, I'll look at it again. And then on that penultimate page in pen, there is a comment. And the comment says, written, scrawled across the document, a document that's in, in all other ways, it seemed very similar to many other documents. And the comment is, however, in Britain, we do not ban things. Since Hume and Locke, through Milton and most importantly through John Stuart Mill, we have believed in free and fair argument. Many people want to ban many things. We never have. Many people would like to ban Mrs. Thatcher, but we're not going to do it. That's to say, suddenly in this archive, there was an unexpected jewel. Was, had that scrawled comment survived, because of an accident, nobody else but me had ever read through all of the pages five times, um, had somebody been too tired to redact it? Or had it been left by some uh, curator close to the story who thought, well, that's very interesting. This um, impartial civil servant, nevertheless, although he's advising government as an impartial civil servant must, be, must do, nevertheless, there is something vivid and vigorous in this old comment. But we will never know whether it was left for me to find or whether I just accidentally find it. And it's that, and of course for me, it was, it was incredibly revealing. It was very funny. Um, uh, it, was, it was a sign of the individual civil servants, uh, personality and indeed education, and wisdom in a funny kind of way coming through. Um, and of course the broadcasting ban was enacted and it was stupid and I interviewed lots of people around it. But it's, it's what that strikes me as being an example of an unintended, what the English writer Virginia Woolf called the fertile fact, the fact that resonates. So that scrawl held in an archive um, told me so much, and of course I delighted in it, and it gave me, I, I, it gave me energy, and it went straight into the book. 
And I give you that example because I wonder, it told me so much about the mood within the civil service in the Northern Ireland office about this decision. It told me a lot. And I wonder whether, so it, it's hanging on to that kind of unexpected argument as a decision that is made. The the unexpected to and fro of, of what I think is an enlightenment issue about arguing a case very, very forcefully, putting the opposite side, that survived in that archive, we don't know why, that seems to me uh, important for us to think and imagine how we would man manage in a historical world without those kind of insights. Would it be there now? So I... Starting with that, you know, that past sad life I've had living in your archives, I wanted to really speak on from that, having in my time helped draft um, as a minor, but I've helped Lord Peter Hennessy draft um, our civil service code about how they must, in the civil service, keep a due record and been involved with um, the BBC's written obligation to keep a proper record of its decisions. Oddly, just as the storyteller, which is a historian, I've, I've come to have this odd relationship to the things that you're the preservers of. Um, and I want to raise some problems about where we are now, many of which I think you will be more expert to me. I don't think that that, that scrawl would survive because it was a moment of serendipitous secrecy. I don't think the civil servant thought Mrs. Thatcher was going to see it, though the civil servants were perfectly prepared to talk to her face to face sometimes. I don't think it would survive now because we live in a world of um, in which the argument as a paper goes round is real. People do have arguments as a decision is arrived, at, but the digital amendment is far faster. And which draft do you capture? There are so many drafts. People intervene so often. So in the course of, as it were, a paper arriving or a digital archive arriving, you've got so many drafts. Um, uh, and, of course, it's the same, actually, with writers' manuscripts, which, of course, we it's a very interesting issue about how we capture the process of writing in a manuscript in a way that we always used to be able to see the workings. So the final draft survives. But do those arguments survive? But I think that is related to the reason why it's a problem, and that's a more serious one, which I want to talk, which I want to call the world of performed decisions. So archives are full of people making decisions, but I think there are three pressures which are literally pushing decisions out of archives. Um, the, so. I think those three pressures are uh, freedom of information, uh, media attention, and searchability. That's to say, uh, most institutions, certainly the ones I deal with most intimately, like the BBC, live in uh, freedom of information used by journalists uh, um, who are not the same as historians, sometimes I think rather mischievously, uh, but nevertheless, that's that's great. Um, freedom of information means that anything that you write down or decide or text somebody may may become available very quickly. So that is a very real pressure to people making decisions, not to actually leave the real trail of decisions, but to leave the trail that is defendable in public. Secondly, as it were, the media are over the whole range of things and you know the media are in all sorts of problems and I really don't want to bash them but they they are very willing because of the nature of the modern crisis to move in on freedom of information very quickly so the temporal the, the moment the time in which decisions get made and made public has shrunk I mean the man that scrawled on that thing was hiding behind 25 years. He didn't think anybody would look at it for 25 years. As a matter of fact, I did. But, you know, I was given privileged access. And the wonderful 
democratic advantages to this. It's just the other side. So freedom of information requests and media attention. And then thirdly, once things become digital, as they digitize, then as it will ability, which makes my job so much easier, also makes the redactor's job so much easier. So these three fantastic innovations mean that and it mean that institutions don't make real decisions in a scrutable way increasingly. What they do, which is a completely understandable response to some of the, these pressures, is make the decision somewhere else, uh, in offices. Of course, this has always been the case, but I think there's a really new pressure. They make the decision outside. They make it in their offices. Uh, and then what they do is perform the agreed decision. They may even perform how it is that the agreed decision has been argued with. That's to say there is a sort of, if it really matters, you, you, you go outside. I'll give a really crude, not very good example. My husband is about to go and live in a container in a palace in Kabul. Um, and as I happen to know, he's going on Saturday. He's going, he's going to fly in with an American general. No trace anywhere on any device of where he's going to pick that general up and where he's going to get on the plane. That entire electronic record has not merely been de-encrypted. De it is de been encrypted. It actually doesn't exist. So an American general is going to fly into Kabul with my husband in his second seat, you know, from somewhere I can't tell you, from somewhere that was communicated by voice. Isn't that odd? So that really worries me about our, 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 how we will hang on to history. Thirdly, I think there's a real problem about speed. I'm used to where little crises turn into catastrophes uh, very, very fast, not least because the BBC, in the most wonderful way, always attacks its own uh, when there is a crisis running. But the speed isn't terribly good for archives either. People, text, phone calls, those decisions, how you really made it, that, that, you know, things happen very, very fast. Fourthly, I think there's something about the overwhelming record and its sustainability. Now, of course, you're all into, I'm sure, into like the uh, Library of Congress, where I was last year, where they're very, very good at, at harvesting sets of emails. Um, but there is, you know, even, so I need searchability, but will I miss the story? Even, they become very, very large amounts of documents. So I think there's a kind of problem about sustainability. So there's a problem about performing decisions. There's a problem about people being able to hang on to them. There's a problem about speed. There's a problem about sustainability. The next thing that really worries me is what it is that we are now capturing. And in a sense, I want to propose that we as consumers, political activists, are living in a true human show. We're living in the Truman Show in the sense that we live in the algorithms of the companies that are trying to use our data, uh, what we want, give us more of what we want. We can see that Facebook and uh, Google, Google probably will start to tackle with that. But of course, many of the companies and institutions we interact with, that we are, in a sense, in the Truman Show, they're in the Truman Show. They're in another Truman Show. They're also being gamed by the big algorithm drivers. Are we capturing the nature of that digital decision-making in a way that we can make sense of? And uh, can we get near it? The answer is probably no. So although I've lived my life in old-fashioned archives because I've been a contemporary historian. I, wa I wonder about what people will be able to live their lives in. And I just want to finish by saying that I think that archives remain um, an important source of institutions' definition of themselves. When there is any kind of crisis, what do you do? You go and get the files out on, in, in some sense, on old problems. 
when the uh, Iraq inquiry report, which is a remarkable piece of historical work actually reported here, very, very icily done, brilliantly produced in the end, you know, the first thing they did was get out all the papers. Um, so institutions need a memory, but I think it's more profound than that, which is that without some sense of where you've come from and why you did things as you did, for better or for worse, um, institutions like people have some kind of sense of soul, and that sense of soul is located in the values. And those values are located in how they have done things in the past, for better or worse. And increasingly in the modern world, actually, values are the key things that institutions, companies, firms have to sell. Values remain very important. So if you go back to Orwell's 1984, which I recently reread, you may be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, to find that it's all about archives. So 1984 by Orwell is usually seen as a dystopia, and it is. But actually, it's a prolonged interrogation of our capacity to maintain the historical record in a way that is you can ask questions of, is fallible, but can give you some sense of what the past was really like. And although we have so much wonderful material, I suppose I just wanted to raise some problems, not in a Luddite way, about how we think our way forward into a new set of digital uh, tasks. And I think it's and fascinating, but I know that if we lose our capacity to hold onto our history, we'll lose our, I'll lose our capacity to think properly. The end. I, I, can I just say, I'm so sorry I haven't been there to be part of your deliberations. I'm just, you know, I'm an alien, really, with a bad foot. <laughs> We're so happy that you could be an alien with us, and maybe there are some questions, and if anybody wants to ask them, I'll just repeat them into the computer here. Does anybody have any questions for Jean? One, one question, of course. Is is the BBC good? Is the BBC doing well now in capturing all the digital data that they are producing today? What is your thought on that, Jean? Um, the BBC is facing dramatic funding cuts. Um, wearing my Cassandra hat, my worry hat. Um, I think. Uh, it's got some of the most important archives in shows you all of what British history is about. Um, it's just okay, but I think capturing that digital decision making is a problem because people just don't they don't print it out, they don't send it. So you know, they just don't think of it, 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 it as being their responsibility anymore. So it's okay, um, but I just wonder if it's. I, I think I think there's something you know. The, the um, both America and the government here oblige people to file digitally. But the BBC has, to some extent, um, I'm sure the big decisions are there in all their splendour. But of course, what one's interested in very often is little decisions about editorial matters. I think those are probably not being captured. And yet, in a way, an editorial decision about which bit of news to put out, whether to put a picture of significant change in how it deals with um, pictures of, of atrocities. Um, now, that big decision is there, but those little editorial decisions, many of which were never captured, I think very uncapturable now. And yet they, they change the, the environment we work in. Exactly. I think we're uh, having a little bit of, uh, or actually we had a question? 
One question from here. You just mentioned that institutions have a soul. So that, that institutions, yeah. let's say corporations or companies or the B, like, institutions like the BBC have a soul. What is the soul of an institution? Because we have a ten, there is a tendency to, to see indeed a, a, a big multinational as a kind of person and with ethical uh, qualities, etc., etc. Uh, but what is, a, what is a, the soul of an institution? What do you mean by that? <laughs> I, think, uh, um, I think, I think, well, I love institutions. I mean, institutions are what keep us safe. Um, I'm, um, I mean, I think good institutions, I'm, I'm in the middle of a foreign office course um, with lots of Indians and Pakistanis, and in a sense what certainly uh, the Pakistanis lack is institutions which are, are strong and sustainable. So institutions are the moral can be the moral. I mean, I think the soul of institutions is what they have done in the past and what their values are. And actually, commercially, um, the values, as it were, of an institution are, are hugely frail. Um, you know, in, in Britain, we all went out and bought um, cars, diesel cars, because we were told that diesel cars would save the environment more than the other kind. And they weren't as expensive as electric cars, which we can't afford yet. Um, and we were misled. We were mis misled about that. So that those, in, those institutional values, which led to the um, hiding and meddling with data in a deliberate way, um, destroys that bit of value, which is a bit of the soul of, an, of, of, an, of those commercial companies. So I think institutions, um, I do think institutions have selves, and, and it may just be that I've interviewed so many civil servants and so many people that live in the BBC, worked in the BBC, that I understand that you may or, not, may or may not be a nice or a nasty person, and you may or may not be um, uh, uh, somebody... But, but that working in institutions and the honour of the value of the institutions transforms how you see yourself um, and how you do your job. And that, that feels to me fascinating. This is a very, very, very odd thing to say. But um, I, I have always thought that I'm a, a, a frail fashion-following um, uh, unbrave um, walkover that I, I don't trust myself. So if you work within institutional frameworks that make you, uh, that, that set structures for the values, then that seems to me uh, something that produces better or indeed worse behaviour. So I, I, I think that you can look at institutions like medicine, which has a very clear set of parameters. So, I, I, you know, uh, does Google have a soul? Well, I think it does, actually. And um, maybe it's having to grow a different one <laughs> right now. But I mean, you know, uh, 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 you may all disagree. Thank you so much, Jean. I think we're going to be rounding off the day here, and we're going to start off with another huge round of applause for you. Thank you so much, Jean.